and to support our work. While disruption of routine and anxiety are difficult for everyone, for autistic people, they can be particularly challenging. More than ever, Ireland's autistic community needs your support. Please text as I am, all one word, to 50300 to donate four euro so we can help autistic people through this crisis and beyond. Thank you. Text costs four euro. As I am will receive a minimum of three euro sixty. Service provider like charity, helpline 076 6805 278. The Sunday Papers on Off the Ball. Now you're welcome, Max. So we're reviewing the Sunday papers we have with this Mary O'Connor, CEO of the Federation of Irish Sport, All Ireland and All Star winner as well with the Cork Footballers and uh, Cork Camogie. We also have Brendan O'Brien of the Irish Examiner with us. You're there, guys. You can hear me. Hi, yeah, Joe. Can hear you. Excellent. I'll just run through the back pages first to kick things off, and it's where ultimately we'll be starting. It's a picture of Mick McCarthy and Stephen Kenny on the back page of the Sunday Mirror. Handshake, it's all yours and they're smiling. Obviously a picture, not from yesterday, but from uh, some way uh, back a couple of months. Uh, it's all yours. McCarthy hands the reins over to Kenny and we'll come to that in a moment. Bonus uh, ball. It's that same picture actually when the two men met a couple of months ago. Uh, bonus ball. McCarthy stands aside for Kenny, but 1.2 million euro payoff will soften the blow after he calls time on his second spell in charge. That's Philip Quinn there in the back page of the uh, mail. Sunday World. Mac your bags, pick of uh, Mick McCarthy. They say here, angry Mick, angry Mick storms off with one million euro in his suitcase as Kenny takes over the reins. And Mick McCarthy left fuming last night when his second reign as Ireland manager came to a dramatic end. That's Kevin Palmer there. I must say in his interview, he was far from fuming. He was class personified, to be honest. Sunday Independent, McCarthy's second going is the headline there. It's a good headline. Picture of Mick. Uh, Kenny takes charge as Mick walks away with €1 million, Euro, writes Eamon Sweeney. And the uh, Sunday Times on the uh, very front page there of the main news section. And it's McCarthy gets the boot early as Kenny takes Ireland team. So lots of writing on this story. Brendan, where do you want to start? What caught your eye? Um, I suppose the front page of the Sunday Times, Joe. Um, the figures are always kind of uh, mind-blowing with these things. And... Um, Paul Rowan and Mark Tyke have uh, a piece on the front page of their paper. Uh, towards the end of it, it's the figures that really jump out. Um, and they say that even after the scheduled exit fee for Mick, the FAI budgeted for its overall international management teams, including the under 21s, to cost 1.19 million, 1 million in 2021. Uh, the figure for 2019 was 3.19 million. Um, when Martin O'Neill was coach and his management team received significant termination fees. So just in that one snapshot, you see exactly what's happening here. Uh, you know, the backstory of where the FAI is at and where it's come from doesn't need uh, any more exploring at this stage. But just in terms of financial figures, that's a, a huge saving already. Mm. Um, it goes into a bit more detail on what McCarthy was on and what uh, Stephen Kenny will be on. Basically, the difference there per annum is 1.2 million against 540,000. And that's reflected down the pyramid as well with the international management team staffs. So from a financial point of view, it's it's really kind of, um, you know, getting back to a sense of normality after all the, the excess of getting Trapp in, getting O'Neill in, uh, the management teams that were there. Very much more in keeping with what you'd imagine uh, an Irish manager should be should be earning. Um, on the football point of view then as well, you know, it makes sense as well. So I think this kind of, it, it ticks both boxes. Yeah, McCarthy, uh, they write in that piece on the front page of Sunday Times, annual salary of 1.2 million, while Kenny will be paid 540,000. McCarthy's assistant, Terry Connor, was on 243,000 euro. Robbie Keane was on about 250,000. The FAI hopes to have the entire wage of Stephen Kenny's backroom team, including an assistant and goalkeeping coach, limited to €250,000 wage cuts linked to the COVID-19 pandemic imposed on FAI staff last week. And Philip Quinn takes that angle on the finances on the back page of the mm. Mail. They quote his uh, interview with FAI TV where he says he was hugely disappointed to be departing as Irish manager. Quinn writes that he could be in line for a further €1 million Euro bonus should the team he leaves go on to qualify for the Euro finals. That was in his contract. Now, Gary Doyle, as Nathan mentioned just before the ad break there, is reporting that perhaps that €1 million Euro bonus would be shared between Kenny and Mick McCarthy. That is all subject to confirmation. But Quinn writes, McCarthy will have earned around €3.2 for 10 games as manager, potentially, 
a staggering 320,000 per match if you divide it up that way. That's assuming he's paid up until the end of his contract in July. In effect, and this is a crazy thing to say, Mary, I know, but really for Mitt McCarthy, this is not about the money. He's been managing since the mid-90s regularly. I'm sure he has more than enough to see him out to the end of his days, even though we are talking about these huge sums. For him, I'm sure it's the disappointment of not getting to finish on a high with the team, potentially, to get to Euro a European Championships. Yeah, absolutely. Um, look, look, I mean, Mick McCarthy is 61 years of age. He's had a long career as a player, obviously. He's had two spells in charge of Ireland. I was interested in um, Daniel MacDonald's uh, article in the uh, Irish Independ Sunday Independent today where he spoke about quoting Mick McCarthy, saying that, you know, he was happy with that decision, gave everybody clarity, but it was bittersweet. Um, I think for Mick McCarthy, it runs deeper than money. I think at, at this stage, at 61 years of age, he's made his fortune. Um, but it, it's interesting that, you know, the amount of coverage that it has got in the short time that the, the writers across all the newspapers had to get the articles put to paper today. But um, I thought Daniel McDonald's article and uh, Paul Rowan's article in this in the Times were really good articles and really gave us a sense of maybe, you know, where the situation has emerged from and maybe give us a kind of a bit of hope towards Stephen Kinney and the under 21s, the way they have been playing free flowing football that maybe he might remain steadfast to his own beliefs and bring that to the senior team because I think the genuine supporter out there is looking for that type of uh, that, that type of football that the other 21s have been so brilliantly displaying, all being taking into account senior international football is, is a di different kettle of fish altogether. Brendan, in Daniel McDonald's piece that Mary mentions there, he writes, it's understood that the FAI ultimately concluded that in this new era for the association, it was important to go by the book. And then he quotes a source who says, what you want is to be straight and upfront with people. It was a hard call, but the right call. From a reputational point of view, it wouldn't look well. And I suppose when he says, when that source says it wouldn't look well, I presume he or she means it wouldn't look well if we started ignoring the letter of the contracts and meddling around into the uh, sphere of some kind of, you know, back channel deal and, you know, whose moral right is it to get into the Euros. They decided ultimately, and I think particularly once the June date for the Slovakia game was moved into Stephen Kenny's tenure and it must be uh, stated that Mick McCarthy has not earned this playoff. If Ireland had finished last in the uh, group they would still have this playoff. It is a legacy of the Nations League and Martin O'Neill and Roy Keane's uh, time so it's not like finishing third has got Mick and the team into this playoff. That was happening regardless and once we went from June post uh, August 1st into post August 1st Stephen uh, Kenny's tenure the decision was probably that bit easier and the decision to, as the source who talked to Dan McDonald said, to just go straight down the line, up front yeah. with people, you know, this is, this is as clear as could be. It's literally a black and white issue. I think at one point in Dan's piece he says the contracts of the two managers were clearly date bound. Yeah. So everything else is just uh, conjecture, wishful thinking, whether or not you think Mick McCarthy should have got the opportunity to take Ireland to... Euro 2021 as it is now, or whether you're in the Stephen Kenny camp, get him in and give him as much time with his feet under the table as possible. It's, it's absolutely immaterial. Mm. And again, we've mentioned already the backstory with everything that's happening with the FBI at the moment. How could they not look at it in any other way and just say, regardless of any other dis debate or, or arguments that were done by teleconference call this week, it's very simple. As soon as somebody says, lads, look at the two contracts, it is in black and white here. And we, of all people, are in no position to actually kind of uh, cut around corners or dig deeper into anything here. This is how it stays. And as you mentioned as well, Joe, I mean, the fact that Ireland are in this uh, playoff semi-final against Slovakia is down to, frankly, an appalling um, system in, in UEFA where our terrible performance in the, in the Nations League still gets us this back channel into a possible major tournament. Um, we mentioned briefly the footballing side at the start, and Mary mentioned the football that Stephen Kenny's under 21s are playing. You know, the ball stats of, of Mick McCarthy's Ireland in a 16 months in charge are 1 3, 2 against Gibraltar, 1 against Georgia, yeah. 8 games, uh, 7 goals. Now, there are a few little pointers that you can make to that. I mean, he jumped straight into a qualifying campaign, he didn't have any uh, friendlies at all to kind of, you know, bet himself back in. And again, that's another reason why maybe in a purely footballing sense that this could be good 
for um, for Stephen Kenny and for the Republic of Ireland. A lot of conjecture still about when this playoff will actually be played. Mm. A few of the lads writing in the paper today are saying that could go back to February or March, that UEFA would be more um, more amenable to having the big guns out for the Nations League in the autumn. Mm. So automatically that might give Stephen Kenny and his new management team games against Bulgaria and Finland at the very least to try out a few things. And as we just mentioned, the Nations League is is so bonkers a tournament that who knows, maybe they could lose those games again, still have a back door down to something down the line. So it's a win-win for me. You suspect the FAI probably have their, their channels in UEFA and have heard through yes. the grapevine that the playoff against Slovakia will be put back to March. Now, what happens to the World Cup qualifiers? I don't know. I mean, they have a bit of wiggle room in the calendar given that it's December 2022 when the World Cup is due to happen. Anybody who is pretending to be certain about anything in the current situation is, frankly, uh, not telling the truth. So we just don't know where that's going to go. And I guess, Mary, one of the key points, and it's in Dan's piece, is that this is legally clear. Because a couple of weeks ago, when we were first talking about this, we knew Stephen Kenny's contract was clear, i.e. 1st of August. And there was definitely some concrete information that Mick McCarthy's contract had a date in it. But we weren't sure if it may have also included until the end of the European campaign, which may have muddied the waters uh, somewhat. But once it was legally clear, then that made the decision very straightforward. Yeah, just I suppose outlines to everybody that, you know, this is big business as well and there's legalities to it. Look, obviously, from a supporter point of view and from a fan point of view, you know, you want your country to succeed and um, this type of uh, sideshow distraction is gone now. You know, mm. there's clarity there. I think everybody would will appreciate that. But um, 31st of July was the cutoff date. It was, it was obviously clear in the contract as well. And, you know, the decision was taken by the FAI. And in the same paper, actually, Eamon Sweeney's article um, on the, the McCarthy uh, Kinney, we'd say, saga, he speaks that, it, you know, that it was surprising and entirely predictable um, re regarding the FAI decision. But then he speaks that, you know, McCarthy leaving uh, is, a, is, is kind of a testament to the last vestiges of the John Delaney era. Um, and I think, you know, the FEI must be credited on making this swift decision. Um, as I said, I have no doubt that Mick McCarthy is disappointed to be leaving and the no one's left. I think there's clarity there now. We, we just need to move on with it, you know, and um, I, for one, will be watching with bated breath to see how we get on. Yeah, certainly the football Stephen Kenny has uh, managed over the past, uh, what, 20 odd years has suggested that we hopefully are in for some interesting times with Ireland. Damien Duff now officially part of his uh, backroom team, if you're just tuning in, as is Keith Andrews, Alan Kelly, goalkeeping coach, Jim Crawford stays with the under-21s and John O'Shea comes in to assist him. That was the official dispatch from the FAI in the last hour. We're obviously very keen to bring you news headlines on the hour, so we're going to uh, break for them now and then we're back and we'll get stuck into more of the papers with Mary O'Connor and Brendan O'Brien in just one moment. Join the conversation on Facebook and Twitter. This is an important announcement from the Department of Employment Affairs and Social Protection. The impact of COVID-19 has been significant. As a result, both the Pandemic Unemployment Payment and the Enhanced Illness Benefit Payment for COVID-19 absences have been increased to €350 Euro a week. These payments are available to employees and the self-employed. The quickest and easiest way is to apply online at www.mywelfare.ie, a Government of Ireland initiative. You wake, you brush, you spit blood, you could have gum disease. You wake, you brush, you spit blood, you could have bad breath. You wake, you brush, you spit blood, you could get receding gums. You wake, you brush, you spit blood, you could lose a tooth. If you spit blood, you may have gum disease. Ignore it and you could be on a journey to much worse. Switch to Corsidol toothpaste. It's four times more effective than regular toothpaste at removing the buildup of bacteria, the main cause of bleeding gums. Leave bleeding gums behind. Corsidol helps stop and prevent bleeding gums. Hi, I'm Quiva Dabara from Trokra. I hope you and those you love are safe and well. In Ireland, we're doing all we can to protect each other. But can you imagine not being able to wash your hands because you don't have running water? That's the reality for many people Trokra supports. This virus knows no borders, but neither should our compassion. Now more than ever, we need your support to protect them. Please give whatever you can. Call 1850 408 408 or visit throkra.org. Throkra, 
until love conquers fear. As the food industry works hard to make shopping as available as possible, we wanted to play our part. So we have created freshonline.ie, a new service from Fresh the Good Food Market. From quality food products to household essentials, we've got the greater Dublin area covered. Click and collect and home delivery now available. For offers and discounts to your basket, visit freshonline.ie today. At Electric Ireland, we're here to help 1.2 million homes save on their energy costs by lowering prices from the 1st of April. Every customer will benefit, with up to €100 Euro in annual savings for homes with gas and electricity. That's millions more in pockets across the country. On top of lower prices, our customers will still enjoy a discount rate that doesn't disappear. Find out more about what we're doing for our customers at electricireland.ie because we're brighter together. Prices valid from 1st of April 2020 subject to change. EAB 1,636 euro based on average annual consumption, urban 24-hour discounted unit rate, standing charge, PSO levy and carbon tax. Residential dual fuel direct debit and online billing. T's and C's apply. See electricireland.ie slash EAB. Savings based on annual consumption. Public transport operators are working hard to keep Transport for Ireland services running for those who need them most. Bus and train services are now operating revised timetables. Services are operating for carers and essential workers and people making essential journeys for food, medicines or medical appointments. Please respect social distancing guidelines. Never take public transport if you're experiencing COVID-19 symptoms and use your TFI Leap card whenever you can. Visit transportforireland.ie for more. COVID-19 is a major public health emergency here in Ireland and around the world. It's having a big impact on the way we live our lives, how we stay connected as communities and how we use open spaces. If you are planning on heading out into the fresh air, here are five things to remember. 1. Stay local, within 2 kilometres of home. 2. Keep a distance of 2 metres from others. 3. Go out with members of your own household only. 4. Always enjoy the outdoors with consideration and respect for the people you meet along the way. And five, wash your hands before you leave home and always observe coughing and sneezing etiquette. Find out more at gov.ie. Supported by the Government of Ireland. Across Ireland. Across Ireland. This is the Imro Radio Awards Station of the Year. This, this is News Talk. It's two o'clock, good afternoon. The HSE says €4 million Euro has been spent on personal protective equipment that isn't suitable for Irish healthcare settings. The equipment, made up mostly of masks, represents 20% of the PPE that's arrived so far in Ireland. After inspection, 65% of the overall delivery was found to meet standards, while a further 15% can be used, but it isn't of the quality expected. HSE CEO Paul Reid says further discussions will take place with the supplier to ensure no no more unsuitable PPE is delivered. I think if you look at our first order, which is just over 30 million, uh, which has arrived in the first 10 flights of last week, 20% if you like the order that we will find a use for, but we will be going back to the provider to get a dis- different specification is to the value of about 4 million. Four and a half thousand people will be tested every day from next week as part of efforts to stop the spread of COVID-19. That's up from the average this week of one and a half thousand. Some testing centres haven't been operating at full capacity this week, but Chief Operations Officer with the HSE, Anne O'Connor, says there'll be more testing from now on. We are managing community testing in line with the available capacity. That laboratory capacity will increase over the coming week and we will scale up our community testing. The sites are there. Uh, they are able to scale up immediately once the lab capacity increases. Gardaí say most people are sticking to the restrictions in place, but that it needs to continue. There's mild weather across the country today, but the force is asking people not to leave their homes unless it's essential. Deputy Commissioner John Toomey has also addressed concerns about how checkpoints are being conducted. In particular, a question has been asked about the wearing of masks. And the advice at the moment is that it, there is no need to wear masks uh, when conducting checkpoints, particularly where we adhere to the physical distancing guidelines of maintaining that two metre distance when talking to people in their cars. And finally, the PSNI has released one of three men arrested after two ATMs were stolen in Dundalk, County Louth, in the early hours of yesterday morning. The cash machines were taken from two separate banks in the town. The raiders also set two cars on fire outside Dundalk Garda Station to stop officers responding. They were later arrested by the PSNI after a Garda chase in which they fled over the border. It's two minutes past two. 
News Talk Weather. Thanks to the AA. To help in these challenging times, we've reduced the cost of our home insurance. Get our lowest price at the AA.ie. Staying dry today with hazy sunshine. There will be some outbreaks of rain later this afternoon, though. Highest temperature is 12 to 16 degrees. And now you're up to date on News Talk. Off the ball. This is News Talk. Now you're welcome back. We're reviewing the Sunday papers. We have Mary O'Connor with us. She's the CEO of the Federation of Irish Sports. She's an All Star and All Ireland winner in both codes with Cork as well. And we have Brendan O'Brien from the Irish Examiner. And Mary, just to give people a sense who won't have all the papers today, we, we will finish off the McCarthy uh, Kenny situation. I wouldn't have said reading everything. There's any great sense of this is the wrong decision or necessarily this is the right decision. Like Gaiman Sweeney makes the point that the FAI have acted with unusual decisiveness to usher in the age of Stephen Kenny. I see uh, John uh, Brennan makes the point in the Sunday World that uh, McCarthy was encouraged to go and having thought about it, he went. And there's a few bits and pieces about the finances which we've touched on. But in the main, I think Mick McCarthy and the very, very classy, dignified, not surprisingly, interview he gave to FAI TV, the way he is elected to depart the scene has made this far easier on the FAI, far easier on Stephen Kenny, and not led to a couple of days of uh, backbiting and recrimination and this is no way to treat an Irish legend and all that kind of stuff. Instead, I think he's taken the higher road, not surprisingly. Yeah, look, I mean, I think it's a, a kind of a testament to the man and I think, you know, it, it does make the, the road a lot smoother and it, it allows Stephen to start straight away without having to, I suppose, deal with any acrimony. Um, I think also it's important to remember that this is less than 24 hours old as well. I think, you know, he broke it yesterday evening around 4 p.m. Um, so people are reacting now, you know, uh, I think in a couple of days people might respond differently. But I think absolutely um, Mick McCarthy's reaction to this has been key because that has allowed, uh, you know, the, the FEI and for Stephen to actually not have to deal with a situation today where they're probably having to uh, defend their decision. Obviously, it does contractual arrangements, but I think the key to this has been Nick McCarthy's reaction, and I think it's for the betterment of, of Irish football, and I'd like to think when Mick was a player and his two spells as manager, over 78 games for the country as manager, I think, you know, it shows that he, he's at the heart of it, Ireland was at his heart, and I think that's important. Yes, and a final word, Brendan, on it before we move on. Of course, we could be sat here potentially in uh, September and Stephen Kenny's first game in charge is against Slovakia, and it mightn't go well, and it will be easy to say, well, was this the best preparation for a huge game like that? But from this vantage point, and it's only at this vantage point that the FAI can make their decisions, it would seem like it has generally been accepted, it is clear-cut, uh, this is not going to rebound massively on them. Yeah, and you made the point earlier, Joe, that you'd imagine the people in the FAI have their their contacts in UEFA and that they, they would be pretty confident that we're not going to see that uh, playoff game this side of Christmas. And just finally, like one point that struck me, and I'm not saying it had anything to do with Mick's um, reaction to the situation, but if you look at it from Mick's point of view, um, we still don't know when that game is going to be on. That could have been on next March, for all we know. Yeah. So it could be you could be waiting 11 months for uh, for one game and you lose in Bratislav or whatever it is, you're done. So flip that another way. We still don't know where the domestic season in the UK or anywhere else is going to go. But if Mick McCarthy is done now, he is, as I saw a quote somewhere in the papers today, he's eager to get back into management. And yeah. if we saw anything from the Martin O'Neill situation when that went south so quickly at the end of his time in charge. It didn't do Martin O'Neill any harm whatsoever in getting another go at English club football at Nottingham Forest. Yeah. So I think, you know, it'd be interesting to see does Mick have the same, how would I put it, the same advocates in the English media as Martin O'Neill did, but he's a guy with a huge track record, as Mary said earlier, and this now places him in a position where he's available for employment again having, even though, like you say, it's because of the Nations League, having taken Ireland to a de facto playoff semi-final. Yeah. Well, I'm sure we'll hear from Stephen Kenny across the week. If we move on then, so there's plenty yeah. of McCarthy-Kenny coverage. Mary, I know a piece that caught your eye, and it was the same in my case reading here in the station, was on page four of the Sunday Independent. It was Tommy Conlon. And this is, you know, complete opposite end uh, of, the, of the spectrum to things like million euro bonus payments and payoffs and who manages the team and all ultimately this unimportant stuff in many ways when it comes to life and death which is the kind of 
things we're talking about now more than ever. So it's uh, Tommy Conlon and the headline is Enough to Make the Heart Weep. And he's talking about Conor Kennelly, who people will have seen over the last uh, 10 days or so, passed away, former Roscommon footballer. And Tommy starts by saying, you'll know that a fella has the football bug bad when he's togging out at the age of 43 and playing in the gulags of the junior B grade. Not even junior A, junior B. There are no more stops on the line after that. And he mentions Conor Kennelly was playing junior B at the age of 43 in dot, 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 Offaly. There are fellas who survived Vietnam who wouldn't volunteer for that. And incredibly sadly, tragically, Tommy writes, last Saturday morning, he dropped dead while out jogging near his home. In that utterly absurd twist of faith which randomly strikes so many families, a loved one was taken long before his time and without any apparent reason. Why him? Why now? Was there not enough death already striking the land and every other land uh, without taking a husband from his wife, a father from his three children and a son from his parents? So that is the very, very striking, striking opening to Tommy's piece. And then Mary, he details the funeral and there's a photo above the piece of a Garda escort for the um, coffin and there are people lining the country road. It looks like maybe the GEA club they're going by and flags. There's a Roscommon flag at half mast as he made the trip back to Roscommon. And as I think we touched on it last week even, but it's going to become a, a theme across the next couple of months. Uh, funerals are not what they were. Yeah, look, and Tommy has wrote some very good articles in the last number of weeks, but this was a really poignant article. Um, I, You know, you, you speak about, obviously, the words hit you off the page, but that picture... Um, is really striking, you know, to see people uh, observing and respecting Connor and standing social distancing and so on. And it, it's just so grave. And, you know, the way he speaks about a father, mother having to bury their son, it's unnatural. It goes against the very grain of life. And, you know, ultimately he died doing what he enjoyed doing, which was exercising, you know, and to be playing um, junior B at 43 years of age in in any county, you know, just, I suppose it just tells you that he loved the game and he didn't want to let go. Um, it's a really, really good article and it documents, you know, his, his life and his career and, you know, how we, even in school he was rewarded for his academic prowess um, as well as his, you know, his, his prowess on the field of play and, you know, it's it, it just a really, really strong article from Tommy. And I think, you know, Irish life at the moment is being challenged in so many ways. But Irish society, when people die, you know, our funerals are a mark of how we we respected them and how much we love them. And, you know, we show that and, and we help people grieve. And this seems so wrong in so many levels that a young man, 43 years of age, you know, a wife and three kids is gone now. And it just shows again. In as well that that community spirit that sport has that it's transcended from not just his home in, in Roscommon where he grew up but down to Ballycumber in, in Offaly as well and how he made his home there and he was part of the community and you know Father Brendan O'Sullivan is quoted in the article as well a really really strong article from Tommy today yeah Brendan he's a Tommy writes of Kennelly that he studied law became a solicitor uh, won a Connacht senior title with Roscommon in 2001 and uh, married Claire Quinn that brought him to County Offaly and he says of his life there, he was a member of the board of management of the local national school. He was a director of the Ballycumber Community Development Group. Uh, he was a man making his contribution to society. And then last Friday week, it gives you a really good sense of the man. He sent a text message to Father Brendan O'Sullivan, who ultimately presided over the funeral just two weeks later. And the text message said, Hi, Father Brendan. I hope you're healthy and well and enjoying a bit of good weather. I know, you were, uh, I know you're a firm believer in community and while COVID is a scourge on the sick and the elderly, I think the change in behaviours that are being forced on us all will embolden communities and see a return to Christian values when the crisis has passed. Stay safe. God bless. Thank you for all you do. All the best, Connor, Clare and the Kennelly family. I mean, that's, uh, yeah, it's very touching, isn't, isn't it? That, isn't that an incredible mark of him as a person? And, and then, uh, if, if I read correctly, it was the next day that he passed away. I mean, how striking is that for something to happen? Um, it's just unbearable, the thoughts of it, that it should happen like that. Um, just going back to his, um, the intro that Tommy, Tommy wrote, um, I loved the line where he described the GA's very own Palookaville as Balian Faluka. I thought that was a lovely touch from Tommy. Um, and again, as Mary and yourself said, it showed how wedded he was to the GA and you know to be still playing ball at that age at any level is, is fantastic 
And, and again, Mary touched on the importance of funerals in general and, and the rite of passage around all that. And, and Tommy describes it very, very well in the piece when he, he, um, he quotes a passage from the book My Father's Wake by Kevin Toulis and how, you know, Kevin is a British-born guy of Irish stock and he's, he's, he's seen the difference in how the, the Anglo-Saxon Anglo world um, deals with um, loss and death and how it's maybe something that is kept at a distance and where it's something that's more embraced and part of the community in Ireland. And, and at a time like this, as the, as the photo on the piece shows with the Irish flag and the Roscommon flag at, at half-mast outside what looks like a, a school or something like that, it, it really does hit home um, what we all lose in, in, in these times. Like, these are, um, you know, individual tragedies that are happening on, on a very localised le level while this global pandemic happens. And, I, you know, in terms of funerals itself, I've seen it myself in the last couple of weeks just before... The restrictions really saw um, a relative of my wife passed away and they had a funeral down in Limerick just before everything really kind of locked down and it was still a large gathering. And then just this week, a family friend passed away and I watched the funeral online. So in that very, very short period of time, literally in two weeks, we've gone from, you know, centuries of Irish tradition and how we deal with the passing of loved ones to this very distant and necessary means of, of seeing them off. And it's, again, I just I, I, it's a brilliantly written piece and it brings all that home very well. Yes, and I, it's one of the things we actually do do very well in the country. The funeral, the wake, it's a proper gathering, it's a proper send-off, it's a proper time to grieve. And I'm sure funerals in the COVID era will be incredibly difficult all around the world, but there's no doubt in Ireland we'll feel that loss acutely, I think. Um, in so much, you know, I, I hate things that say, you know, I, I hate saying anything is very Irish and very this and very that. Yeah. I think we're all far more similar than um, we care to admit, but the funeral tradition uh, will be acutely felt, the loss of it will be acutely felt over the coming weeks, no doubt. It's just such a, a part of the, the grieving process, Joe, for, for centuries, mm. you know, and it's what's been handed down to me from my parents and so on. And, you know, it's, it's an opportunity as well to know that if, if you love somebody that you can show and show that as well. So that old adage that, you know, you know, you love, you grieve, you, 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 if you grieve, you've loved, you know, and I think it's just the way Tommy has um, put pen to paper on that article today really is, it could be about any individual across the country um, who has passed on. Um, but this is a really tragedy that he was just out exercising, mm. probably trying to do his bit to keep fit while the COVID-19 pandemic is on. And um, it, it's just so sad for him and his family and, and for all the people that are involved in the local communities down there in Offaly. Yeah, for sure. Condolences to all concerned, his family, his parents. It's just a, a dreadful time for them all. So that's Tommy Conlon, page four of the Sunday Independent, if you want to read that piece. We'll switch to the Sunday Times, Brendan. Oshin McConville, uh, familiar to us all. He's a brilliant pundit these days. He was uh, equally brilliant forward for Armagh, an All-Ireland winner back in the day. And uh, there's a fantastic interview with him where he's talking about uh, his addiction to gambling and ultimately how he worked his way out of that, the influence Tony Adams has had on him and some of the work. I wasn't fully aware of the extent of his work, but some of the work he has done now where he's been over with you know Manchester City for instance or various rugby clubs in the UK where he shares his experiences with the players. Yeah very good piece very well written by Dennis Walsh. Um, uh, uh, yeah like yourself Joe I, I would have been familiar with a lot of the basics um, the foundation of this story but again is the, the depth of his work while I knew he was doing stuff in gambling addiction I didn't realise it was at that level I didn't realise he was talking to professional sports people in, in the UK as well and there's some very in interesting observations on the difference in reactions that he got when he would walk into maybe a Premier League dressing room and then into a Rugby League dressing room. And all the more startling when you think of the geographical similarities there, like you could be in the Greater Manchester area, you have, you have all those fantastic um, football clubs, but you also have your Wiggins and Witnesses and, and all these people. So one little geographic area and yet the disparity in how they were addressed. And, and basically what he was saying was that the Premier League footballers might be sitting down in this state-of-the-art kind of lecture room, not even aware of what this was. It's just another part of the day, whereas the rugby league players were coming in very well briefed. This is what happening. And basically what he was saying was the rugby league clubs were far more uh, bought into the process. They were far more aware of, of, of what was going down. And when you look at the monies involved in, in um, Premier League footballers' salaries, which are obviously a huge story at the moment, 
it's frightening to think that you have young men in that situation with access to so much cash and with so little education being put their way, um, so much emphasis being put on it. But Oshin's story, um, you know, is is an incredible one. It's it's very moving. He talks about going to get help for um, for his gambling addiction. He talks about the impact that the book addicted by the Arsenal captain Tony Adams had on him. And uh, the line that, that that really kind of dragged me in towards the start of it was he was at the therapy um, centre, um, the treatment centre in Galway, and a sister, Concilio, had um, sat him down one day um, and Oshin said to her, look, sister, I do have faith, but I'm going to struggle with the religious end of things. And she said, think of it like this, religion is for people who don't want to go to hell spiritualities for people who have been to hell and back. I mean, it's, you know, from a treatment point of view, from a journalism point of view, it's just a sentence that mm. immediately grabs the attention. And um, it's uh, it's a very well-written article. And Oshin is a great advocate for the dangers of gambling, which are all too rife in society. And, um, you know, he talks about how his impression of being addicted to anything was the guy in the park bench with the brown paper bag and the bottle inside it so I, when I first saw this I had my journal, journalist hat on it um, whenever I see a piece like this I think what's the connection with what's happening now which is obviously frayed a bit given there's no sport happening now so journalists have that a little bit more leeway to kind of go that interview with Oshin I always wanted to do I can do that so this this in a sense it sits entirely of its own accord it's not linked in with Arma playing a you know, promotion final in the league or there's nothing being launched here. It's just of itself and it makes it all the stronger, I think. And because it, there's not, I don't think there's a single mention of COVID-19 in it. Mm. It's just a self-contained piece that draws you in, brilliantly written and a great story well told. Yeah, well, he gives a real insight into the nature of his addiction and he talks about reading the Adams book, which at the time was fairly revolutionary. I remember reading mm. that Tony Adams book and it was, it was a very different departure at that stage to the norm. But he said, I, he read it twice when he was in treatment, Ushin. He said, I related to absolutely everything Adams was saying. So much of it was about lies. A lot of it was about putting on a facade for people, putting on the mask, walking outside the door. I'm England captain, I'm Arsenal captain. And deep inside feeling completely hollow. Just nothing of any meaning really there. And I latched onto that because that was a lot of me. In 99, Armagh won our first Ulster title in 17 years. And I was going around with my collar up. And if I could have got a pair of pink boots, I would have worn them because I wanted people to think I was the man, that I had all my shit together. I was cocky, arrogant, all of those kind of things. I wanted people to see that because I couldn't let them see how insecure I was. Uh, when I read the Tony Adams book, it gave me affirmation. That's what that was about. And that hollowness he talks about, if you pause there and get to the very end of the article, he says, the big change in my life was being able to hug my kids. Once I got the thoughts and feelings back, my life changed dramatically uh, since then and to this day. Tomorrow, he knows what it takes. And almost um, building himself up from the inside out was the nature of his recovery, Mary. Yeah, look, any um, art, uh, interview that Ocean has given in the last number of years has been extremely honest. Um, and this was a really honest article as well, very well written by, by Dennis Walsh. But there's a line there for me following on from Brendan's um, commentary, Sister Concilio, who actually brought out a book there about two years ago called The Harbour Within, a, a really excellent uh, book. But um, he, uh, Oshin speaks that the first time that he actually heard somebody say that he was addicted to gambling is when she said it. He said, when Sister Concilio said to me, you were addicted to gambling, she was the first person to tell me that. Mm. I mean, I found that unbelievable that, you know, that was the first person to say you are addicted to gambling. gambling. Um, really excellent article. And I think how he's, you know, you hear, hear these stories about how he's turned his life around. But, you know, he's owned up to all the, the, the wrongs he's done, you know, speaks in the article about the debt repayments um, and mm. how he's... Uh, a determination to repay all the debts he had and meeting goodwill along the way. But, um, yeah, really excellent article and uh, kudos to both uh, Oshin and Dennis for writing it. Hey, that experience he had where the sister had to say to him, look, you're addicted to gambling, and him thinking, well, I, that's not really how I picture addiction, and him having to come to that realisation. It's interesting that later on, Mary, he says that when he speaks with, or when they speak with Premier League footballers, for instance now, uh, they have the same issue in that... Um, he, uh, he quotes Tony Adams, who recently said that uh, gambling addictions in the game are a bit of an e epidemic. He said in their interventions with players, one of the first things they do is a financial health check. 
So on request, bookmakers yeah. are obliged to give their clients full internet betting history. And if one of the sporting chance counsellors feels that a player is in denial, then they just have to show them the numbers. And he has a quote, I've sat in front of guys in professional sport that said to me, listen, I don't really have a gambling problem. I gamble a good bit, but I'm not losing money. And then you start going through stuff and all of a sudden they realise they've lost 150 grand in six months. Uh, these guys think in numbers and they need to see it down in front of them. So that's, it's obviously uh, a thread, you know, Ushin's experience, Premier League footballers' experience. Sometimes you need someone to really hold a, a clear mirror up to their behaviour. Yeah, look, obviously, Premier League footballers, they have such huge disposable income. Yeah. Um, you know, putting a few bets on probably wouldn't cost them at all. But, you know, I think I think it's, it's really good that Ocean has gone into the educational side of this and he's really seen to have taken ownership of that as well. But um, <clears throat> I think this education piece is, is more important for guys and, and girls who are emerging in the emerging talent area you know, but 17, 18, 19, because, you know, you've got Premier League footballers now who are 19, 20, 21, earning big money and a lot of time in their hands as well. And, you know, I think the the work that Oshin and his like are doing are going to be very important because, um, as we can see in the papers today as well, you know, reference to Premier League players taking uh, cuts to wages, you know, in terms of, in light of the COVID-19 pandemic and so on, it just shows how much they're actually on already, even when they take maybe a 30 or 40% cut, you mm. know. Mm. Well, that's where I'm going next, actually. Football finances, a huge amount of coverage on this whole area in the papers today. So Eamon Sweeney in the Sunday Independent back page, for instance. There's Robbie Fowler, who's written a piece in the Mirror. Uh, Wayne Rooney, I know you liked uh, Brendan as well in the Sunday Times on a similar uh, topic. We have Jamie Carragher blasting Liverpool for furloughing non-playing staff. So let's start with Eamon Sweeney, because he, he, paint, he paints the broad picture, Brendan, which is almost important here. Uh, he starts off by saying Barcelona have asked their players to take a 70% pay cut. The players at Juventus have agreed to waive their next four months. Uh, Bayern Munich, Borussia Dortmund have cut their players' wages by 20%. And then talks about Spurs, Celtic, Newcastle plan to have their non-playing staff under the British government's furlough scheme, whereby 80% of a worker's wage comes from the government. And he says, in doing so, it is revealed that clubs widely regarded as commercial behemoths are to a large extent built on sand. He said few predicted that the financial effect on major clubs would be so immediately uh, devastating. And he compares football clubs to major corporations. He says the difference is football clubs are different because the financial model adopted by many of them verges on the unsustainable. The current unforeseen calamity threatens to topple the, house, uh, the houses of cards. And he compares, for instance, Barcelona Barcelona, he says, 200 million euro in debt, over 80% of their budget goes on wages. Real Madrid, by comparison, actually, just 20 million in debt and spend less than half of their budget on wages. So Barcelona being an example of one of those clubs where they are potentially built on sand. They don't have this rainy day fund, Brendan, and yeah. he extends that to a huge number of clubs. Yeah, and if you, if you step back, I mean, the great thing about this piece from Eamon is you've gone into a lot of detail on the detail, and it's not turgid, it's not figures just washing over you. Yeah. It explains it very well. There's some great examples in it. And if you step back from that detail from the moment, what he's basically saying is what we've all been saying about football ever since TD money started flooding in is where will this bubble burst? Mm. And at a time like this, when everything has been, uh, the pause button has been pressed on us, it does give us the chance, as we've seen in a lot of media articles, wondering where football goes next. How do we get out of this? What happens next for football? And just to go back to the Ushi McConville piece for a second, there's a yeah. link there as well. Even though that was a piece and of, and of, of itself, um, gambling in sport and gambling in the media is an issue that we do have to look at as well. And I think we're all guilty of that in some respects. You look at the Eamon Sweeney one, um, there's a brilliant way when you get into the, the, the guts of the article where he, he perfectly, in my opinion, he establishes the absolute insane nature of, of finances and football. And that's the situation with Alexis Sanchez. It's yeah. just bonkers, the money that he has actually been paid. So he explains that since Sanchez arrived at, Man at Old Trafford in January 2018, and he says proceeded to play the worst football of his career, he has cost the club £64.5 million between wages, signing on fees and bonuses. That's £391,000 a week um, and basically £75,000 for every fee, for a, of a fee for every game he started. Then he goes into even the deeper recesses of it. When he moved on loan to Inter Milan, 
Milan would only pick up 4.5 of his £16 million salary. And then the kicker at the end of it all is, so because he's been crap for Milan, for, for Internazionale, sorry, one goal in 15 games, he'll be returning to United and get this, picking up a £1.1 million loyalty bonus for doing it. Mm. I mean, there in those two or three paragraphs, we have everything. Like you say, Joe, again, 80% of Barcelona's, um, you know, um, spend is on wages. Mm. I mean, it has to end somewhere. We've all been saying for a long, long time, this will burst at some point. Nobody thought it would be a global pandemic that would do it, but it's coming down the track. And we've seen, um, you mentioned the Wayne Rooney piece earlier on, how um, it's all been kind of turned around onto the footballers, not just by the clubs and the billionaire owners, but by the NH, not by the, the health secretary in the UK as well. Yeah. And Wayne Rooney makes some fantastic um, arguments about, hold on, why all the focus on us? And here's, here's the holes in that argument. So something has to give somewhere. Yeah. And it'll be, it'll be lovely to think that this pause will give us time to rectify an awful lot of it. But do any of us think that it won't just carry on in maybe a slightly more straightened version as it always has before? Well, it's, it's, it's carrying on in front of our eyes. And, and you might grab the Rooney um, page there, and we'll, we'll come to that in a second. Mm. And Johnny Walters was on with Chair and Nathan on Friday, and, and he made the point that he felt it was very easy for uh, Tory MPs to point the figure at uh, rich uh, footballers from working class families. They wouldn't dream of having to go at a banker, for instance, earning yeah. even more money. But there is... Uh, there is a question for football to answer in terms of the owners at the moment and how they're doing things. Like Eamon Sweeney says, uh, it's also uh, very possible here that some clubs are putting on the bail booked at the moment, the poor mouth. And he, he gives the example of Spurs, and I, I, this is just ridiculous. So he said only four months ago, announced Spurs had become the eighth richest club in the world, 459 million in 2019 taken in. Uh, the club has just moved into a new stadium, which cost a billion to build. And now Spurs have cut the wages of its non-playing employees by 20% to make them eligible for the furlough scheme while not touching player salaries. And he goes on to say that they're asking the British taxpayer to pay for their non-playing staff and they continue at the same time to give their players an average weekly wage of £76,000. And that is, insofar as I can see, a disgrace, that they are taking taxpayers' money. We're all going to have an enormous tax bill to foot here in this country and in the UK, and we, I, to, to add to that, to when a club could pay their staff is, is crazy, especially when they're paying out, as Eamon says, an average weekly wage of 76,000 to the players. So Julian Knight, the Tory MP, during the week, he said, this exposes the crazy economics in English football and the moral vacuum at its centre. Like Mike Ashley, Newcastle, also uh, uh, availing of their furlough scheme. He's worth two billion, for instance. Harry Redknapp, the former Spurs uh, boss, quoted, he says, uh, the government were going to pay ordinary people who are struggling, help small businesses who are struggling. But if you're talking here about a club where players earn 10 to 12 million a year, Tottenham are owned by Joe Lewis, one of the richest men in the world. His club are cutting the wages of all their non-footballing staff by 20%. I can't believe it. Sure. And, and, and in, in those terms, this is not directed at the players. And we'll come to Rooney's piece. But Mary, in terms of what, how the, some of the owners are behaving, for me, that's inexcusable. You can't be looking for taxpayers' money and continue to chuck 300 grand to a couple of players' way. Like, I mean, the, the article is, is full of stats, but as, as Brennan said earlier, it's not truncated. It's so easy to read. But, you know, Eamon goes after Spurs again. He said four months ago, Tottenham were the eight richest club in the world. They had a new stadium that cost one billion to build. Daniel Levy was um, given a three million bonus for the completion of the White Hart Lane project. Never mind, he says that it was eight months late and drastically over budget. Mm. So it's just, it just seems to be systematic of the whole process over there. You know, um, it, it's, I've often spoke about the Premier League and the football as just virtual money, just you know, built on sand is a good way to, to describe it. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not. I'm. I'm a bit cynical about the Premier League and um, what's going to happen there in terms of when we get back to whatever normality will look like. Um, going on news reports this morning, the Premier League players have declined to take a 30% uh, pay cut, and um, they say that it would mean that it'd be 200 million less to the uh, UK government in taxes. They would prefer to open up a um, a charitable fund. Um, either which way, you know, obviously 
I just think that the money in the Premier League is astronomical. You know, it's it's the same in Spain, Italy. These people are on really, really good money. But um, I think the article that Eamon wrote today really uh, spells out clearly mm. uh, that there is a, a moral vacuum. Uh, Jamie Carragher on the back page of the Mirror, this is on the back of his tweet, where he said of uh, Liverpool, you know, he said Jurgen Klopp showed compassion for all at the start of this pandemic, senior players heavily involved with uh, wage cuts, and then all that respect and goodwill is lost. Poor this. And then he tags in at Liverpool FC. And Stan Collymore, similar tweet, uh, it's just plain effing wrong. Uh, fellow football fans, furlough is for small business staff to keep those small businesses from going bump and goes on to say every Premier League owner has serious cash and make money from skyrocketing values of the club. So uh, what aren't you getting about your owners dipping into their pockets? And, and that brings in Rooney. He feels, Brendan, in the Sunday Times in his column, that footballers have been hung out to dry a little bit here and also a little bit too early. I mean, he's, one of the points he makes, which I think is very fair, is hang on here, we're, we're, we're 10 days, two weeks into this and it's changed rapidly after each passing day. Do you want to give us a chance to get together as a, you know, how many hundreds of disparate people across Premier League and Championship and see what we want to come up with? Do you want to give us a bit of time, maybe? Exactly, and, and that's worth mentioning in, in relation to a piece by uh, Rod Draper and Mike Keegan in, in the Daily Mail, which goes into a lot of the discussions that are ongoing and the people involved in it. You know, um, Jordan Henderson is believed to be fairly prominent in what's going on. Um, I don't know. I, I know Wayne Rooney's first column or two was described in the Sunday Times as in conversation with Jonathan Northcroft, their chief football writer. I presume that's still the case. Yes. But however it's written, uh, you know, uh, Rooney is not a guy when, when I was watching playing football I ever thought would be this respected club captain, um, the grey beard, and a guy with, you know, fantastic, very erudite um, opinions. But this piece, it just makes so many, and, and his previous pieces have been good as well. This piece just makes so many great points and the, the pull quote in it um, is probably the best of them. It says, in the biggest crisis of our lives, why is footballers pay even in Matt Hancock's head? Yeah. Hancock, I think, is the health secretary in, yeah. in, in the UK. And you have to, you know, applaud the British government and, you know, the billionaire owners in the Premier League that they've been able to get public opinion by and large, I think, on the side of multi-million, multi-millionaire footballers who do tend to get a bit of a hard time in, in the court of public opinion. But some of the points that Rooney makes are just so bang on and they expose the, the ludicrous nature and the, 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 the alacrity with which everybody has jumped in on this. So one of them he says is a um, very simple point. He's 34, he's had a long career, he's been a world-class player with fantastic and huge co uh, contracts. He says not everybody's like that. And he talks to the one player who uh, plays them at Derby, who lives with his mum in a council estate. Um, so he's a youngster that hasn't had time to build up any security to fall back on. So 30% of a £2,000 a week wage is very different, you know, for, for yeah. what Wayne Rooney is on. And some of the other points are, are just really good as well. And one of them that we've heard is, you know, asking footballers to take a 30% pay cut is basically, I think that they worked out of £500 million. £200 million of that would go to the exchequer. So that's being taken away completely from this fight against the virus and what the NHS can do. Yeah. Another point Rooney makes is they have players from all over the world. They have players, as he points out himself, from Africa who are, you know, parts of that continent are far less capable of withstanding what's going to happen than, than Western democracies. Yeah. Surely some of those guys should have the choice to divert any money they want to their own countries. So it's a very, very good article and it exposes a lot of all that. It does. And a really key point as well, which jumped out to me, is that there is a Machiavellian PR game going on here. Because mm. Rooney says, you know, Hancock comes out in his daily update. And as you say, said, he, Rooney wonders, why is the pay of footballers even in this man's head at the yeah. moment? But then he says, yeah. then what happens is, the timeline of this is, is very striking. The Premier League then announced it was looking for players to give up or defer, defer wages by 30%. And Rooney says, this is despite owners and the Premier League board knowing, knowing that players were already deep in discussion about what the contribution should be. It seems strange to me because every other decision in this process has been kept behind closed doors. But this was publicly announced. Why? And it's obvious why. And he says why. It's to shame the players. It's to, it's to turn this on to the players, even though the Premier League board knew these discussions were ongoing and even that's I, I can see why his back is up about that how this whole thing has
has turned on the players, Mary? Yeah, look, I mean, I, I enjoyed the article today as a lifelong uh, United fan and a, a, a fierce fan of uh, Wayne Rooney when he played. He does really make some um, interesting points, um, you know, and I suppose that on top of what Eamon Sweeney was saying in his article, um, I think for me, um, he's honest in that he says himself he's had a long career. He's 34, he's club captain. You know, he has built up that security. Um, but I think also, you know, his comment, what really stood out to me was, you know, why is Matt Hancock just yeah. singling out us? There's so many professional athletes in, in, in the UK across a multitude of sports. It's But it seems the one sport they picked on once, the Premier League, um, but look, as I said, um, I think this is going to go on and on. But, uh, you know, ultimately all we want to have is get some kind of a normality back and people playing games and so on. But I don't think that this, uh, the wages and this argument is going to go away any time soon. No, I, 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 well, the, the furloughing of staff, that should be addressed, I've no doubt. By the way, Robbie Fowler yeah. then in the mirror on page yeah. 57 goes to town on Matt Hancock. He uh, says that uh, the taking of pot shots at easy targets is not a good look. I'd also suggest that as a Tory minister, he would do well to start looking at the billionaires who don't pay anywhere near enough tax in his country before he takes cheap and easy shots at people he doesn't know. Is he having a go at Richard Branson, who lives in a tax haven and is a multi-billionaire, and yet is asking the country to bail him out? No. Or Mike Ashley, no. Or the owners of the 20 Premier League clubs who between them are worth almost 100 billion and pay hardly any tax in this country. He then adds brilliantly, I'm not being political here, which he, he entirely is. Uh, he says, why the hell single out footballers when there are bankers here who earn far more and financers who are currently not working and yet no one is saying they shouldn't get paid when they're not earning. He goes on to say, I don't hear financers getting called out by Tory ministers. Because they're not famous, it's easy to have a go at, say, Raheem Sterling, David De Gea or Mesut Ozil. And then one last point, he says, I know from my Liverpool connections that Jordan Henderson is one of several Premier League captains involved in trying to sort this situation out. These things don't happen overnight fully formed. They need to be thought through and planned properly. Uh, the players want to make a difference. And he says, and you know what, I'm not party to talks or anything like that, but they will give millions to help our incredible health service professionals. And he says maybe it will help buy some PPE. You know, he says, the PPE, Matt Hancock, that you still haven't given to those people on the front line 10 weeks after the first case in the UK. So that's Robbie Fowler's response, which is very strong as well. Um, there's, a good, there's a good wider, wider you know, angle in all this as well. I mean, for the last number of years, we've seen the whole process of food banks in the UK and clubs um, contributing to all this and, you know, corporate social responsibility. And at a time when governments, governments in the UK especially, have been slashing funds to public health services. I mean, why is any of this about, you know, even billionaire owners or, or millionaire players? Why does this have to be part of the conversation? It has to be part of the conversation because all these um, frontline services have been slashed and burned for so long. So, I mean, Hancock coming out with what he said during the week, he's been absolutely called out for it, and uh, rightly so. Yeah. Mary, before we go, you want to just add a bit more pain to Loud fans of 2010. Yeah, I read with interest um, Dermot Crowe's article t today um, in the uh, the paper, a really good article, and he speaks to Peter Fitzpatrick about that legendary day, or infamous day, I should say, uh, on the 11th of July 2010, when Louth were were robbed uh, of a Leinster title, their first in over 50 years, and I remember watching that and the total injustice of it. And you know, Peter Fitzpatrick, you know, says he still thinks about it every week. You know, mm -hmm. it came across as that it's still very raw because it was just so unfair. Um, and it kind of details that and, and the fallout from it, and you know, speaks to players who were obviously highly involved in the likes of. Um, Joe Sheridan and Seamus Kenny, but for me, um, it, it, it just kind of sticks out to me is that, you no, know, the way I read the article is that the Mead players didn't feel that it was their decision to make. And, you know, they, he speaks about meeting on the Monday night in Gormanstown um, after the game for a kind of a, a going to the sea and a stretching session. And they felt that the decision wasn't in their hands. And I just think back when I was playing that if something like that had happened, that you know you would as a team kind of say well if we wanted to offer a replay we went to the county board that you know that could be something that would happen and I'm not sure did it happen or did it not happen but it doesn't you seem know, to have. it seems like they wanted the decision taken out of their hands yes 
Yeah, and I, I would take uh, umbrage of that. I'd be disappointed if that's the case because as a group of players, they should have said, no, no, what's fair is fair. But, you know, and Dermot references um, Leash and Carlo back in 1995 when something similar happened where Leash were awarded a point and it was shown on television that night that the gate, the point was actually wide and Leash offered Carlo a replay and Leash emerged victorious. But they got an awful lot of plaudits for doing that in sportsmanship. But... Even now, for me, as a, as a neutral watching it that day, I would feel for the likes of great players like Paddy Keenan, you know, who deserved that Linster medal. Uh, and I think for them, it, it was a, it's a really huge travesty, you know. Yeah, and, and Peter Fitzpatrick, the manager that day, who's obviously now a TD and, and head of the county board in Louth, is still incredibly raw about this whole thing. He's only washed it three times, and he washed it for a third time relatively uh, recently. And he says, we had our best team in nearly 50 years on the field that day, but that shook the living daylights out aloud and we're still recovering. And um, it's Martin Sludden. That's uh, Sludden's first name, isn't it? Uh, from yeah. memory, sorry. Yeah, Martin Sludden. He, uh, he never saw him or never spoke to him. He saw him at Michaela Hart's funeral, he was saying, but he hasn't actually spoken to him uh, since that day. And he remembers going into the dressing room afterwards and Sludden informed him that in his view, that what happened to Sheridan was a foul. And Fitzpatrick says, well, I told him that Sheridan had thrown the ball into the net and asked him why he didn't consult his umpires. Sludden said it was a penalty. So I said, well, if it was a penalty, why didn't you give the penalty? When I asked why he didn't consult the umpires, he asked me to leave. I left then. And um, Sludden declined to get involved in the interview with Dermot Crow. I'm not surprised. I don't suspect he wants to relive it over and over again. Brendan, what can he say? He made a mistake. I'm sure he doesn't feel great about it. At the other end of the spectrum, weirdly, uh, so Joe Sheridan is the kind of quote which almost jumped out to me the most. Because he said, last weekend while out uh, shopping, Joe Sheridan encountered a random passerby who made a light-hearted remark about 2010. That was his only offering. And Sheridan says to Dermot, I'll probably be remembered for that more than anything, or any, or, sorry, I'll probably be remembered for that more than my actual career, unfortunately. Uh, when you look back, I think it was an absolute horror show the way it was handled. The team weren't given any protection. I don't think the GA handled it particularly well. It was unprecedented. We as a county needed more direction from them. It was put back on us. And interestingly, Brendan, he says, like, they celebrated that night, but he talks about the things they missed out on. Like, we, he says, we didn't yeah. even bring it round to the local schools and let the kids see it. It was all almost uh, brushed under the carpet. And in 2010, Mead disappeared that season as well. Like, they went nowhere. So yeah. it's not like there's a... The, uh, you couldn't really say Mead are winners in all this either in many respects. Certainly Joe Sheridan. I wouldn't like every time I go to the shop 10 years yeah. on to be reminded of it no and like Joe Sheridan was an amazing footballer you know what I mean I was at that game that day I was covering it and just reading this article I was, I was actually shocked A that Peter Fitzpatrick bothered to look at the video once I don't know how you could, be, could bring yourself to look at it three times in ten years mm. second thing that really shocked me was how late in the game it happened literally the kick out from the goal happened and the referee blew it up and I had no memory of it being that late and Joe Sheridan makes the point that if that goal had been scored in the first minute it would have been very different but yeah. you're right Joe even though he says you know we didn't feel a need to apologise those were the rules it's football you move on Mary made the point afterwards that you know um, you know she'd prefer maybe if um, the players had offered or, or the team had offered the, the chance of the replay but they did celebrate that night. If you look in the article, they did celebrate that night. And you have to put yourself back in, in their mindset that evening. I mean, think of all the emotions around that game, the way it was won. It was only really in the days. Funny enough, I remember the, after, the, the fallout from it much more than the game itself because they would have been covering that at the time. And it was literally that sense of, will Meath do the decent thing? Um, you know, what are Croke Park going to do? It was a bit of an information vacuum. So I do have sympathy for Meath. I mean, that's their, still their last Leinster title. And as Joe, Joe says, it's been completely... It's airbrushed from history, really. Yeah. It's not a title that anybody in Meath is ever going to, should ever take pleasure from. And for Louth, it was their big shot in 60 years and counting and one that probably won't get for a long time again. Yes, yeah. Well, listen, folks, on that note, we'll leave it there. Um, my thanks to both of you. Thanks so much for getting up, getting out, getting the papers and, and taking time to do it. Mary O'Connor, CEO of the Federation of Irish Sport. Before you go, Mary, uh, I think it's just worth remarking on how difficult it is, is for lots of sports people and people working in the sports industry. I saw you quoted a couple of weeks ago in the Sunday papers about people's employment and the worries and 
sports going to have a real way out, you know, to find their way out of this? The Premier League, ultimately, built on sand or otherwise, will be okay. But there's various sectors of Irish sport now which will need a lot of help over the next 18, 24 months. Look, absolutely. I think people are realising now that, you no know, sport is a big business in this country. You know, you have national governing bodies of sport who have been staff employed. Um, you have clubs across the country who are either amateur clubs or professional clubs. Um, and I think it's important that people understand that, you know, at the moment, um, it's a state of unknown because we don't know when we're going to get back up active again. And, you know, there are a lot of NGBs are exposed because their season is about to start or has started and they're missing out on footfall, gate receipts, you know, investment, sponsorship, you know, subscription fees and so on. So it's really, really difficult. Um, I know the NGBs, uh, the national governing bodies and the local sports partnerships are being really active and trying to reach out to people online and communicate to their own members and their own audience to keep them active during this time. But, you know, there's an awful lot of work going on behind the scenes uh, to try and ensure that when you know, this pandemic uh, is, is over, that sport emerges as the leader it is now uh, to get people active again. But it, it's going to be difficult, you know, for the very basic reason that, you know, sport uh, by its nature causes crowds to gather. And at the moment, we're not allowed that to happen. And I'm not so sure how long it's going to take um, for us to actually be able to do that again. You know, you're not going to be able to have 10, 15, 20,000 at games in the next couple of months. And that's the real stark reality of it. And in the, in the interim, you know, people need to be paid their wages, you know, sports needs to be planned, but it's, it's a really difficult terrain. And, you know, there's a lot of hard work going on behind the scenes with Sport Ireland, um, the government uh, led by Minister of State, Brenda Griffin, the Federation and are, uh, are working hard as well. And, you know, at the moment, what we can try and do is support our members um, we have 110 members, support them through communication and letting them know what's available to them through government supports as well. And if they have a specific challenge or concern that they can come to us and that we will work with them to try and help them. But it's a really difficult time. But uh, sports people, by their very nature, we're resilient um, we're strong-willed and we will come through it, but we will need support. OK, Mary, thanks for that. CEO of the Federation of Irish Sport and Brendan O'Brien of the Irish Examiner. Thanks, Brendan. Cheers. Cheers, guys. Off the ball.